organization in Los Angeles. I've been really fortunate in my lifetime to have participated in several campaigns or actions that had positive outcomes. And I'm really hopeful that a lot of good is going to come from this. Noah Purifoy, an assemblage artist transformed by the Watts Rebellion. And the odyssey of his life takes place like he's born in that situation. Right out of the gate, he's met with the confrontation of the American dream versus his reality. Michael Maltzen's Star Apartments, a unique architectural approach to addressing homelessness in downtown Los Angeles. When people remark about the quality of our design, they don't always know that we're housing chronically homeless folks in them. There's a little puzzlement at first, but it, it, it is an entree to a larger conversation. And the cross-border muralism of artist L. Mack. You know, it seemed like this was a major crisis, and I felt a sense of responsibility to pay homage to these people. Next, on Artbound, My name's Janet Owen Driggs. I am a writer and a member of adjunct faculty at various institutions. As an umbrella, I'd say I'm an artist, but I'm not quite sure what that means these days. <laughs> um, my name is Robbie Herbst. I'm an artist and a writer, and I also uh, enjoy earning a paycheck teaching elementary and middle school art at the Hollywood Schoolhouse in Hollywood. As an artist, I'd always been interested in uh, moments when artists gather power and particularly attracted uh, as a poetic notion, um, artist labor uh, and artist organizing. Writing this article was a way in specific to just focus on this moment where um, art schools are looking towards the SCIU and other unions in Southern California to help them coalesce power. 1970, 78% of faculty were either tenured or on tenure track. And that is a, a protected employment status. And you get benefits and you have certain levels of protection. Today, we have uh, around 70% of faculty are not tenured or tenure tracks. That means only 30% are. And 50% of faculty are now part-time. And being a part-time member of faculty means that you have no security of employment, you get short-term contracts, usually a fairly low remuneration, um, no benefits at all. That trend which um, the American, is it Research Institute, mm -hmm. calls this a trend for non-investment in teaching services, is paralleled by increasing investment in non-teaching services. So there's a concurrent rise in the bureaucracy of teaching institutions. So they're becoming far more corporatized. In 1970, it cost around $10,000 a year for a student on average to go to school. That's more than doubled now and quadrupled for many of our private art schools. And it's over $40,000 a year to go to CalArts. So the two things really go hand in hand. The students are being well overcharged. Most of them are being trained to become adjunct faculty. That's how they, tr they sustain themselves, or are supposed to when they leave school. And they're trying to pay massive loans back on adjunct, adjunct um, pay if they can get it. Janet and I uh, wrote this article um, after an artist adjunct organizing event at Human Resources, which was organized by an SCIU organizer, Adam Overton. And Adam is an artist and several years ago signed up to be a full-time organizer with SCIU, and he's very much embedded within a performance community in Southern California. So the event at Human Resources was, for me, a really powerful moment of bringing a community from across the city of adjuncts who teach both in art schools as well as community colleges, the UCs, the Cal State system, together to talk about labor. And then- uh, And in students. A, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but there were a lot of students there as well. Those moments are really exciting just to see manifestations of artists and all workers gaining voices. To see people take control of their lives in really interesting uh, communal ways.
I mean, I pretty much follow activists around and try to get involved in their, their causes, their issues, their actions. I'm really interested in a kind of under-told history or set of histories. I would consider myself a political artist, and then I work in a lot of different mediums, but drawing runs consistently through my practice, as does video. And I work a lot with political graphics, so words come up in my work over and over again. climate justice and feminism and immigration issues. All of these things are affected by, by labor. And in my lifetime, the division between poor and rich has gotten so extreme. And so many people spend so much time working and for, for not enough pay. Bearing witness. And I'm sort of like you know, old fashioned history recording, <laughs> documenting. I've been working on the Fight for 15 campaign maybe two or three years. I started just doing a mural in Detroit, and I found this amazing image of the Fight for 15 in Detroit and I turned that into a kind of billboard, and that's where I discovered the Fight for 15 campaign. The horror of what it means to make a minimum wage in this case, it's not, like it's, it's there is no dignity. <laughs> there is no living wage in that kind of income. I started to go to the marches here and just started meeting people, but then simultaneously, the, the unionizing of Otis began of the part-time faculty there through the SEIU, and the SEIU is also organizing the Fight for 15 campaign, focusing on the McDonald's workers. On average, 70 to 75 percent of all college teachers are part-time. So that means they have no health insurance, they have no retirement, they have no job security. So that, I don't think that most people grasp that when they're sending their kids to college or when you're young and you're going to college. 70% of your teachers are, have, have no real you know, tie to this institution and are being underpaid. I think that we've reached a breaking point and I think it's starting with the private schools. So on one side you have the majority of the workforce completely underpaid and on the other end you have students who are, you know, overpaying. And so we've reached a crisis point. This is one part of a much larger national problem. And so I'm hoping that through being involved in this union we can start to see how this situation can be fixed or can be changed. I entered college in 2007 and in 2008 the economy crashed and it kind of changed the whole world and at that time my dad actually because of the recession had lost his job 
I was in school, I was learning how to be an artist. At the same time, I was watching the news and learning all about this recession, about the mortgage crisis, and really kind of just learning in general about politics and economics. The decision to go to grad school despite the debt really came from this realization that I simply didn't want to live in a world where people like me, people from my background, would not have the opportunity to go to school because of money. In a lot of ways, the availability of the loans really just perpetuates the problem of tuition costs. But I think at the end of the day, I figured that the best thing to do was really to take the opportunity and make the best of it and try and use my experience and my opportunity to really help other people as well. I think Noe is an incredibly talented young artist. He just graduated from the graduate public practice program. Noe literalized, he made physical his student loan debt, you know, by silk screening ones, what, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and one hundreds. And it's a massive amount of paper, and he's selling them to try to pay off his student loan. I was in debt, and I was $50,000 in debt, and at the same time, I had no idea what $50,000 even was, right? Like, I had never owned $50,000, I had never held it, I had never seen it, never had it in my bank account, so it just seemed very surreal. So while it started as a really personal project, eventually, you know, it, it became about more than just me because really it's not, it's not just me that's in debt and really it's a social issue and I think it's important to frame it as such as a problem that really involves everybody. I think that Noe's project really was a huge motivation for me to be involved in the union because on a really personal level, how can I ethically continue to teach in this program when many of these students graduating would love to have my job someday, but if they have my job, they will never be able to pay their student loans off. So No Way's project made that so clear to me. It really motivated me to do the work I'm doing from the faculty end. I think this is going to continue to grow as a project for him because I feel like he's learning organizing techniques and he's learning to build a community from this. And I think that he could be part of great change in terms of this problems with student loans and student debt. If you want to create change, you need to get organized. Part of my practice is very kind of traditional, me working in my studio by myself. But the other part of my practice is the more socially engaged part of it, which is working with other people towards a broader goal. And eventually I came in touch with the Los Angeles College, which is a group of artists working out of CalArts, and found out that they have this kind of uh, group think tank session, which is all about looking at creative ways to deal with student debt. And so I really was supportive of their work and that's why I decided to invite them to Otis to hold a second think tank event at Otis, which I think was also really successful. The other thing that I think was interesting that you brought up, Chris, about like value, like the value of education. I like thinking about how maybe some of this anxiety and the stress comes from the fact that like this education is of no value. There's value and there's a return, but it's not a financial return. Mm -hmm. So if that's not, if that doesn't adhere to like a standardized like model or lexicon, then like it doesn't mean that there is no value. So how do we either A, bring visibility to that value or B, infiltrate the current like lexicon with that, this other like mode of, of thinking or talking about that kind of work? I mean, even the word, isn't the word value like, implying finance like doesn't the, our, the like our entire use of the word value but is that true but then are we perpetuating that system if we also like if we continue to use it in that way we can all complain about there not being assigned value to these things but what is the value 
Well, the value isn't necessarily coming from the students now. The value is coming from the debt that's created it now. So well, that's definitely. $50 billion in <laughs> interest on student loans is what the government collected like last year. The level of organization that we're going to need to solve the student debt crisis is going to be on par with that of the, um, of the labor movements in the early 20th century. You really have to coordinate and organize in this incredibly complex way, but it's possible. I mean, it's subtype mortgage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. giving every student a mortgage they can exactly. And we know that they won't be able to. Yes. I think it is super awesome that our city council just voted in a $15 minimum wage requirement in this city. And I am super proud to be from the city and to have been a part of this campaign, and this campaign needs to continue. It doesn't mean we stop fighting, right? Because in five years, it's 15 is not gonna be enough, but it's like, huge progress. I've been really fortunate in my lifetime to have participated in several campaigns or actions that had positive outcomes. And I'm really hopeful that a lot of good is going to come from this. I'm really excited to see what happens. My name is Tanya Mladen. I am an arts and culture writer based in Los Angeles. When Noah Purefoy was in his 70s, he didn't have enough money to stay in Los Angeles and live. So he moved out to the desert uh, right outside of Joshua Tree, and he created um, the Noah Purefoy Outdoor Desert Art Museum of Assemblage Sculpture. Museum is kind of not the right word for it. It's more like a theme park for adults to go see art. But it was where he spent his retirement and was still able to make art. Even in the last five years of his life, he was wheelchair bound. He was having his friends help him construct these beautiful sculptures, like one called Ode to Frank Gehry, which looks like it's sheet metal and it's white, but you can see the kind of formal elements that influenced the piece. And then he had some very politically charged pieces. He had one called Voting Booth, and inside the voting booth there was a toilet. When he moved to the desert, I think that's when he did his most interesting work because that was when he was the most free. And as a consequence, his work in the desert is huge. There are, there are huge sculptures that he really, he couldn't have done in the city. Um, and he probably wouldn't have had the inspiration. To him, the elements were very much an inspiration and the way that things naturally decayed and, and created new things. Um, for him, that became part of the work.
to it. There's so many textures going on and so many types of forms that it doesn't look like iconic land art statements. Though there are these major interests that so many of these artists, including Noah Purifoy, share, and those are how is nature affecting the process? How is erosion and light and shadow and heat affecting what you're doing in the land? But I do think it's interesting to note the differences because there was this talk in the 60s with land artists of leaving this white cube system and that was joined by a reality that many of these artists had financial support and were also exhibiting at galleries that were internationally known and respected and that is a very different reality from Noah's reality. My parents were sharecroppers and by the time I was three I was out in the field trying to help them pick cotton. Noah was born in 1917. I'm not sure if people can imagine what that world was like for a black person, but it was, uh, I'm sure it was challenging. And the odyssey of his life takes place like he, he's born in that situation, not in, the, in a wealthy family, and then goes on to go to college. And what he wanted to do is be a teacher. Uh, he studied history, but at that time they'd only let him teach shop. So right out of the gate he's met with the confrontation of the American dream versus his reality and his view of the world. After the war, he did degrees in social work and then made his way out to California. Purefoy came here as a migrant, part of a huge swath of people trying to get away from the American in Southeast and its history. So when I think about that space, I think about a greater sense of African retention because of its proximity. And so you don't have the same thing out here. It just doesn't exist. He arrived in LA in 1951 and first was working as a social worker at a county hospital. And uh, he's working there for a while and and one day he just gets up and walks out because he knows that this isn't going to do anything either. Then in 1964, he was offered the opportunity to step on as the founding director of the Watts Towers Art Center. And that was a really big turning point for him as an artist. Not making objects, but bringing different kinds of people together really became his artwork. So the Watts Towers Art Center's mission, in addition to working with the community, was to use found objects because Simon Rodia had used found objects in this masterpiece of his. And then shortly after he stepped on there, there was this massive race rebellion in Watts. It became one of the most violent events of the 60s. There were numerous race rebellions at that moment in time and of course we're living in a moment in time where this continues. So in the wake of August 1965 he went out into the streets of Watts which really resembled Dresden. You know it was completely bombed out, charred everything and began collecting this burnt debris. And I think at that point uh, when you're so actively involved in collecting that material even whether it's from a riot or whether it's out here in the desert you begin to have a different view of who you are and how you fit into the picture of the world. And that was Noah's way of responding to that. That moment, Watts essentially, was really the catalyst for Noah as an artist. He decided that using found objects would be a sort of manifesto. And he and his colleague Judson Powell gathered together a group of six other artists and did this landmark undertaking, which they called 66 Signs of Neon, not only as a way to explore assemblage, but to also use these statements as a tool to talk about societal issues affecting not just Los Angeles, but the nation. There are all these reference points in Purifoy's work to Dadaism, to Surrealism. Uh, those artists who were working in the wake of World War I and working from an environment that could only be identified as having been destroyed. And, and I think Purifoy definitely comes from, from that place, uh, amongst others. 
And then to think about how art is not just something to be looked at, which is also the other thrust of Purifoy's career, which forces the question of how can one be most effective? I think that's really the basis of his activism, not necessarily going out and manning the barricades in the community, but trying to present things that might not be there so people could see outside of where they were. Then in 1972, he left the art world. He was completely disenchanted by the early 70s with how little change had actually happened and how impoverished and still broken down life was in Watts. And he was offered the position as one of the founding members of the California Arts Council, which Governor Jerry Brown started in 1976 and he's works with the Arts Council for about 10 years. And there's some uh, kind of discussion about him not making art for 10 years, but I feel that it's at that point that his real conceptualism comes out because he begins to develop programs, artists in schools, artists in communities, artists in prisons. And his work be leaves the kind of the physical thing and becomes much more conceptual. Many artists in the 60s took up social issues, but to feel convicted enough to devote every day of your life to, to trying to enact change. He had this incredibly rich life that had different modes at different times. So there is that push-pull between the art and the activism. And I think that he brought those things together uh, at different times in his life. In 1987, though, he's getting older and he decided that he was into. His practice changed when he moved to Joshua Tree. You know, in LA, trash was so plentiful. There was junk just piled, especially on the streets of Watts. And here, people recycle everything. And so he found himself for the first time going to swap meets and trying to strike up relationships with local businesses and neighbors, telling everyone, look, you know, I use, I use everything. So if you have extra materials, bring them to me. And this is, you know, this is what he created. So all of these pieces, you know, speak to these experiences in oblique ways. You know, you look at them and they're aesthetic statements and they, they, they're speaking about all these sorts of formal problems, but then there's these stories that lurk behind them. This piece that we're sitting in is called Shelter and it relates to his experiences as a social worker and reflected on the experience of living in LA in the 80s during the Reagan administration when so many people were kicked out.
and creating work, especially out here in the desert alone. Something that I like to point out to people when they're out here is that he was 72 when he moved out to the desert and he had no assistance. And these days in the art world, I mean, every studio is full of a gazillion assistants. Nobody can make their own work because that's not what the, the machine demands. But he was out here doing this all by himself until 1999 when he had to use a wheelchair. And over the last 15 years of his life, he built this masterpiece. Coming out here to the desert was perfect for him because it allowed him the freedom to work without the framework and consciousness of a commercial space. And ironically, you know, LACMA wasn't going to show his work back in the day. insert them into the history because they're not there. And there's if I'm not mistaken, about a third of the artists in Whitney are artists of color. Now, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. But it's about the recognition that it's all relevant, and it's all important. That has not been the tone of our society, ever. My name is Lyra Kilston. I'm a writer and editor focusing on art, architecture, design, and the history of Los Angeles. The Star Apartments is a new housing project uh, commissioned by the Skid Row Housing Trust for formerly homeless individuals. It's permanent supportive housing. It's designed by Michael Maltzen. This is the third project that Maltzen has done with the Trust. And one of the very unique things about the Skid Row Housing Trust is that they have design engagement sessions with the residents and the staff of the buildings. So this is, a, this is very unique. I mean, most developments don't incorporate that kind of feedback from their future residents. They, they more just prescribe and des they decide what they're going to do and what they can afford and they do it. So the trust has this, this very wonderful program where the architect is actually brought in and presents the design to the residents and the staff and you know, other kinds of clinical workers that might be using the building in the future. 
and they receive a lot of feedback about what works and what doesn't. These are people that have perhaps lived in other trust buildings and they know that, you know, maybe they really like more outdoor space or they like a rooftop view or they really enjoyed the fact that they had direct sunlight coming into their rooms in the morning. One of the buildings I visited, there was a window, there was a community room and there was a window that obviously it served a purpose to let light in, but it also gave a view right out to the street, right out to like a very important meeting place on the street. And as it was explained to me that they did this very intentionally to have the people inside the building be able to watch and see what was going on on the street as opposed to drawing, you know, kind of building a wall between this life and their new life. Downtown is gentrifying rapidly and just a few blocks away from the Star Apartment, you know, there are all it's condos and leasing signs everywhere and new restaurants and bars. And I think that in a place like downtown and in fact a lot of Los Angeles that, I mean, that is sort of spread out and horizontal, you, you don't really, you don't necessarily know what's happening a few blocks away. There's a way that I think you can live a very nice life in downtown and if you want to pretty much try to ignore the fact that Skid Row is four blocks away and by having these prominent striking buildings, you know, the kind of thing that you're not just going, you, you don't just think is an eyesore that you're actually going to, to, you know, see and think, you know, what is that? That's great. Is that a new condo or something? Um, it changes people's opinions about what home, housing for the homeless can be. It is clear that, that this city and this region is becoming denser and denser. Up until now, the city has looked to just push its, its boundaries further and further out to build more and more single family houses. And that was a part of our identity. That was a part of our psychology. But when that perimeter, that boundary, potentially gets reached, and you, you have to begin to look back to the city to build again and to build greater and greater density, how do you transform? And I think the challenge then can be even greater here in many ways than it is in other cities where you have a longer history of multifamily, vertical housing, you know, apartment towers. Um, LA doesn't really have that history. And to the extent that we do have it, it's been very politically controversial. The history of public housing here being tied up in McCarthyism is, you know, it's not a very proud history. And so um, we have to move away from our, I think our, our focus on this, this single family ho house as the as the kind of basic DNA, architectural DNA of the city, the basic building block of the city. One of the ways that I think the work as architects that we do can begin to experiment with that is to look at density, not by importing models from more traditional cities, but to try to invent density, to try to invent a communal living on our own terms. What we are looking for uh, is exactly the right balance by uh, finding a way to produce great density for uh, the community, uh, to allow for the space of the individual, uh, but to also provide for opportunities for the building to connect in realistic ways through retail spaces, through outdoor community functions, through shared landscape functions that will, I believe, weave the life of, of this new community more consequentially, more deeply into the ongoing life of the city that surrounds it. Anyone who's using a new building really has a sense of um, what message it sends about their place in society. And I think the really remarkable thing about these projects is that they signal, first and foremost, to the people who live in the buildings that, they, that there's a kind of respect for them built into the architecture. Typically, when people remark about the quality of our design, they don't always know that we're housing chronically homeless and homeless folks in them. And so um, there's a little puzzlement at first, but it, it, it is an entree to a larger conversation that these two things can coexist. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we believe that um, people who have been, I'll just use the word designless in their experience being homeless, 
um, really need to have the best design places to live um, that give them the opportunities for things they did not have an opportunity to um, uh, engage in while they were homeless. To be homeless is to be uneasy. It can get very hectic and frustrating. This little thing's not, not being able to take a shower when you need to take a shower. It's uh, not having little things that we take for granted. I never thought in my life I would be homeless. <laughs> After, you know, I mean, You've been healthy, you know, you work. I've been working in the United States for 30 years, but after the year 2002, I got cancer. So I find out, you know, after that, I can't work anymore. And I couldn't believe it, I'm homeless. <laughs> Anytime you apply design to this kind of a social problem, there are always risks involved for, for uh, an organization like Skid Row Housing Trust because there's always a certain part of the population that will see any kind of design or architecture, especially architecture with a capital A, as wasteful, um, as a kind of wasteful spending. And I think the line that Michael Maltzen has had to walk here, which is a really tricky one in many respects, um, is between being really efficient and making every dollar in the construction budget go as far as it can and also bring some character to the building and also signal to the residents that the architect and the organization itself really cares about the quality of the space. I was ready to get my life in order and uh, I needed to uh, receive phone calls. I needed to take showers. I needed to have clean clothes on to go to interviews. And it was difficult to do that in shelters and so uh, housing was a very important factor to me. I prayed to God for two years to have the one place to sleep and take a shower and then cooking, you know. One place and be safe. Outside with danger, I got raped twice. So in here I feel like, you know, I'm more private. When I got housing, I still had issues. And, I, and, I, and, 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 and there was moments of despair, but there was a difference. The difference was, is that I didn't stay stuck. I wasn't stuck in frustration. And because I had help, housing helped me. And I wasn't willing to give that up for no crap, or, no, or, or nothing that alcohol was gonna bring me into. I did not stay stuck. I moved out of that situation. Where I'm at now, I'm working in a community center. People come in and I help them with resources that they, that, that they may need in the community. You'd be surprised if the people don't know the starting point of how to get SRO housing, Skid Row housing and trust housing. They don't know that. They don't know the starting point. They don't know other housing that may be affordable to them that may be uh, resourceful to them, they don't know where it's at. So housing, affordable housing, is an investment that we need in this country to help people right where they at. We really began to realize how we could organize space within a building that we were developing from the ground up to facilitate recovery from homelessness and the accompanying disabilities that people may, may have. Obviously, the uh, opportunity to create services offices for our medical partners, our mental health partners, um, but also opportunities for they themselves to become managers of their, of, of their own well-being. And we found that people really gravitated to the kinds of non-clinical activities to complement those clinical services. So we found the tremendous benefit that people got from outdoor space, gardening, uh, art, um, yoga. So we found that the more they were able to do that, the less likely they were uh, to return to the streets because now they really did have something to live for.
You're, you're putting together a group of individuals who are not, they're not a family or they're not a community by choice necessarily, but uh, in many ways by convenience. But many of the mechanisms that we are depending on in the architecture, creating courtyards, allowing there to be real visibility uh, within the space between individuals, to create and choreograph opportunities for people to see each other and to run into each other and, and be able to have impromptu uh, conversations. All of those are, are attempts to find ways to truly develop lasting, sustainable community in a city that hasn't, doesn't really have any models for how that has existed up until this time. I think the lesson of this kind of socially engaged work in architecture is that you have to try to strike that balance between um, efficiency projects that are really practical and durable, but also works that have enough architectural personality that they can be published, that they can have a life beyond just the building itself. For the homeless people, this play, that's a perfect play for us. And we can start, you know, uh, find a job or feel comfortable or look for a different way to live. You know, when you make money, you know, you don't care, you know, you think you later on, you make money, you buy a house, you buy... Now I know it's a value place. I think oftentimes people saw homelessness as an intractable problem, that I can't do anything about it, um, so I'm not even going to worry about it anymore. And I think that we've shown uh, you can do something about it. Um, and it is, it does have a solution. Um, and it's up to us to figure out how they can be a part of it. My name is Jim Dacian. I'm an associate dean and a full professor of art history at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. I focus a lot of my research on street art and graffiti, and it's an area I think is incredibly exciting and perhaps most exciting movement in art history happening. The role of street art and graffiti is reversing what's happened in the art world. You know it's art the moment you see it in the street, and it's one of the reasons it's become the art of the people. It's Instagram. It's hashtagged. It's touching folks in a way that art has never done in the modern era. Miles Mac McGregor, or otherwise known as L. Mac, is an artist that was born in Los Angeles in 1980 and is someone who's focused on the Southwest. He is an artist that is not classically trained at all. He's self-taught completely. He actually developed an incredibly realistic style that harkens back to portraiture uh, from the Renaissance. He's an unusual individual in that he is part of this subculture of graffiti and street art, but he's also part of a very long tradition of portrait making. And there's nothing better than combining those two things that don't seem like they go together and they do gloriously in El Mac's career. El Mac decided to do a, a, a special project in El Juarez and El Paso on walls that faced either side of the border and that told the story of two different families and the tragedies that they have been part of. Elmac, in addition to bringing attention to the violence with border relations, is able to focus on the internal spirit that each of these families exude and they come out in each of those portraits. Yes, sir. What are you doing in Mexico? Painting a mural. Painting a mural? Yes, what sir. What does the mural live? Uh, for a more proper artist, it's a young lady, young girl. Want to see a picture of it? Sure. caravan for peace passing through who was actually here at, at utah i took photos of the members of the caravan you know people that had lost loved ones to, to violence and, and injustice and stuff and so i um i really wanted to paint these people 
it's a new year in our gorgeous border town and uh, with it comes a brand new piece of art for downtown El Paso and also for Ciudad Juarez and uh, today my guests are uh, El Mac, graffiti artist El Mac and uh, graffiti artist from here from El Paso, Mr. Dave Grave Herrera, otherwise known as Grave. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, also, we are joined by Ricardo Fernandez, who uh, is here on behalf of Amor Po Juarez, who made the mural project possible on our sister city side. So um, we have the fortune of talking to you all as you're working on the mural. And uh, when the show actually airs, it'll be up and gracing our, our downtown. Um, can you give us some background about, let's talk about the medium first uh, and what it is, you know, your 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 graffiti art, mm -hmm. spray can art, um, kind of give us a little lowdown on that and how you started. And I know uh, Mac and Grave, you guys have been friends for a while. Yes. Uh, yes. So just kind of yeah. take us through your journey and then we can get to how we got to these yeah. gorgeous binational yeah. murals. You know, I kind of have a history of painting, you know, regular people, humble people, um, you know, campesinos, you know, just regular, regular folks, you know, workers and, um, and so that's that's something that's always just growing up in the Southwest. You know, I grew up mostly in Phoenix. Um, spent some time in, in Las Cruces. Um, that's something that, you know, I always felt was kind of... Um, it, it, it was something that I was seeing in my life that I wasn't seeing represented in, in art very much, you know. And I felt like it was it was something worthwhile to portray and, and 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 I guess in recent years I, I felt like even more of a sense of um, I don't know urgency or, or or motivation to sort of represent maybe pay homage in a way to you know these these just regular people of the Southwest you know and then the border region and 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 I guess because of a lot of the the border issues and conflicts and, and injustice and, and you know killings and all the stuff that's been going on over the last I don't know since like 2006 or so roughly you know mm -hmm. things have you know there there's been a lot of um, changes for the worse you know maybe in recent years it, it, it it's gotten a little bit better um, here in Juarez you know it, it, like at some point a few years back. You know, I was looking at statistics, and, and I'm not good with numbers, but I just remember seeing something about, you know, the, the number of border deaths, you know, like like uh, migrants that, are, that were dying just from crossing through the through the deserts was was higher than the, the death toll in, in Iraq yearly, and, and at least on the U.S. side. And it was just, you know, it seemed like this was kind of a, a major crisis. And so more and more I felt like as a, as a resident, of the Southwest, as someone who who grew up in the Southwest, it seemed like almost a. I had a. I felt a sense of responsibility to pay homage to these people. Mm 